everything inside me. Hi everyone, how are you today? I hope you are always healthy. Anyway, regarding the previous discussion, I am a bit surprised by your enthusiasm about dinosaurs. And many of you are asking about the fossil. So in this video, I will discuss it. For those who haven't watched the previous video, I recommend you to watch it first, because it is very related. You can click the link in the description box below. Without further ado, let's get started. The word dinosaur was derived from two Greek words, meaning terrible and reptile. They were given this name by their inventor, the English paleontologist Sir Richard Owen, in 1842. Two other Englishmen, Gideon Mantell and William Buckland, had previously and independently come across large fossilized bones which they had been unable to associate with any known animal species. Mantell believed the Earth may have been inhabited at some time in the distant past by some unusually large reptiles, but, it was Owen who took the unwarranted step of asserting that this hypothesis was a proven scientific fact. To his credit, Buckland understood that the worldwide flood described in Genesis would have caused a major dislocation and redistribution of animal carcasses, making it difficult to draw any hard conclusions as to which fossils belong to which species. The iguana and the crocodile provided Richard Owen with a basic prototype for his dinosaurs. As the 19th century progressed and British scholars pushed more and more for explanations of natural phenomena that disproved the Bible, the flood was forgotten, and unquantifiably long periods of time became the norm in geology, paleontology, and astronomy. The great advantage with epoch spanning millions of years was the scope they gave for postulating new theories, without ever having to actually prove anything. Whatever the experts agreed among themselves, no matter how absurd, became the accepted scientific position. It also happened that most of the experts, a cozy group of connected individuals, were Anglicans who had graduated from Oxford and Cambridge. Before I continue the video, please give a like if you've learned something. And, don't forget to subscribe, and also, click the notification bell too, so you won't miss any update. And, watch to the end, to avoid misunderstanding. Thank you. Another problem, right from the time fossil collecting became popular in England, was the temptation to commit fraud. A good specimen could attract a high price on the open market. Basic questions regarding provenance and authenticity were set aside in the race to discover something new and make a name for oneself. For example, there was no way to establish whether a specimen was genuine or if the fossil had been fabricated and buried in a location where it was sure to be discovered by enthusiastic fossilists. Lyme Regis and Dorset became famous across Europe as a source of major finds, though the experts were at a loss to explain how, over millions of years, so many prime specimens had managed to expire beside the same small village in southern England. Even a brief inspection of the annals of fossil hunting and fossil reconstruction will reveal how easily it lent itself to fraud. The scientists always seemed to find what they wanted to find. Fraudulent finds could be arranged quite easily, and another dinosaur species, another proof of evolution and an ancient earth, could be added to the shelves of the Natural History Museum in London. Oddly enough, apart from occasional finds by fossil hunters in France, Germany, and the United States, the numbers recorded outside England were abysmally low. England had Mary Anning, a simple woman who roamed the beaches of Lyme Regis and made spectacular finds from time to time, but for some reason, no other nation on Earth had someone with her very peculiar gift for lifting rocks and finding prehistoric monsters. It is commonly thought that a fossil is a bone fragment preserved in a casing of rock, but this is a misconception. A fossil is a bone-shaped piece of rock whose contours have been defined almost imperceptibly 
by the shape of the bone, buried in the sediment from which the rock was formed. Fossils are found only in sedimentary rock. There is no actual bone remaining. Every one of its cells has been calcified or mineralized by groundwater over a long period of time. Thus there is no DNA in a fossil, despite the claims made by science fiction writers. If that is the case, then, how is it possible to distinguish the fossil from the rock? That is a very good question. Seemingly one needs a trained eye to detect where the rock ends and the fossil begins. For some reason, the only people who have this skill are paleontologists. But what about the well-delineated fossils that we see in some museum specimens? Those which are genuine were formed in the flood about 4,300 years ago, when animal carcasses were carried off in great quantities by torrential ocean currents and funneled into large repositories of mud and biomass. Over time this material was compressed under its own weight and the embalmed bone fragments were calcified. The same cannot be said of dinosaurs. By definition, they must have been entombed in a rock formation for at least 65 million years and subjected over all that time to immense compression. It would be impossible for any organic substance to retain its structural integrity in these circumstances over such a long period of time. This means that all of the large dinosaur fossils on display in museums today are fake. In the same way that a stage magician employs illusion and misdirection to deceive his audience, the agents of Satan have for centuries been implementing on the world stage a set of cleverly interconnected lies to mislead and deceive mankind. The world is run by a small group of highly intelligent, extremely wealthy individuals who are more devious and deceitful than would seem humanly possible. They work closely with their infernal master in the supernatural realm to implement his schemes and draw mankind completely under his spell. Religious people must start thinking far more seriously about the world they live in. Do they see it as God described it in his word, or do they see it through the distorting lens that Satan is using to lead humanity astray and open a path for the Lucifer? They seem to have forgotten that the children of wickedness are as busy today as they were in ancient times, that they hate the righteous, that they take pleasure in deception, that they devise dark schemes behind closed doors, and that they worship a god who loathes God. Comment below with more topic ideas for me to discuss. As a lot of care and hard work goes into this, likes and subscribe, let me know I'm doing a good job. All is appreciated greatly. You may not agree with everything from the content I post. Apply critical thinking and use discernment to come to your own conclusions regarding the content. Thanks for watching this video. This everything inside me channel, see you on the next video.